Stan, you've been sitting much too long. <laughs> much too long. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to Truth, a radio program designed with you in mind, a program whose sole purpose is to empower you, our listeners, for information leads to knowledge, and knowledge is, you got it, truth. <laughs> and as always, I want to empower you to take control of your life, those things that impact you, your family, and your community. As always, too, we want you to go to the website. We want you to go to the website at www.gwen-truth.com so you can access all of the resource listings that will help you be all powerful. <laughs> ah, and these are links that will connect you to the municipalities, county agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, and advocacy groups. Also, go there so you can take part in the uh, query that we have going. And this query, uh, the other 100% of you said that um, that you don't look to others to make you happy, you know, which is quite frankly not true. A lot of people depend on everything else, circumstance and all that kind of stuff to make them happy. But okay, <laughs> so but the new question is this: Do you agree that the age to receive Medicare should be increased from 65 to 67? Do you agree with that, yes or no? That is uh, part of the proposal that's being considered in terms of something that we're going to be talking about tonight, which is the fiscal cliff, along with uh, what they commonly refer to as Obamacare and its impact, uh, tax returns, all of that good stuff. And this is a great time to talk about that as we near the end of 2012. Also, <laughs> I want to say to you guys, uh, just give you a shout out in my prayer is that you have a very, very Merry Christmas and the happiest of New Year's. And um, give a shout out, of course, to all of those who are, you know, have suffered some loss. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Connecticut situation, which was horrific. We all know that. We all agree with that. We all agree that something needs to be done and hopefully that will happen. Uh, not just in terms of the gun issue, but in terms of mental health. And a lot of advocates for mental health in this area have been saying there is a need, not only in terms of funding, but in terms of the services and everything else that's necessary to help individuals who have problems. So uh, that is something else that a lot of us know and are aware of. And hopefully now that we're all agreeing and saying that we understand, at least to that extent, uh, we can come together and work together to make something good happen uh, and something good come out of a terribly bad situation. As has been stated, Gwen Asma Edwards, former city commissioner, retired city clerk, city of Daytona Beach, president and CEO of AE Enterprises, Inc., a consulting firm on politics and ethics. And um, again, shout out to you all. Just remind you for Christmas, please, please enjoy your family, enjoy your friends, enjoy your surroundings. Thank God for what you have. may not be what you totally want, but at least you got something. You are blessed. Remember, you are blessed. So just count your blessings. Say thank you uh, to whomever. I say thank you to God. And then enjoy. Enjoy. Okay? Again, my guest tonight is uh, Suzanne Forbes. Uh, Suzanne is not only a CPA, but she's office manager at James Moore um, and Company a CPA firm that works mostly with a, a commercial and mainly commercial and, uh, and uh, government, right, Susan? We do quite a bit of government work, yes we do. We also work with individual business owners and individuals. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I always ask that because <laughs> if I didn't have my son who was a CPA, I'd be running to you guys to, <laughs> to take care of, uh, of my taxes and the like. Wonderful. Did a test there to make sure everything is working as it should. Uh, they are a fantastic company and I don't say that just because she's here but I say it every time she's here and I say it even sometimes when they're not here because they are a fantastic company. James Moore and Company. And she's not here to promote her business. She's here to share with all of you um, about issues as it relates to um, to our taxes 
and especially as we look at health care issues and as we look at uh, this fiscal cliff and help all of us to understand just what it means. Um, and uh, Suzanne, you were saying, and I, and I should mention too that Suzanne is also uh, chair of the Halifax Area Chamber of Commerce. One of the few women that have been in that position, so I applaud her for that, and I applaud her, she and her company, for all of the great and wonderful things they do because they are super community partners. They get involved in all kinds of, of um, issues, um, issues in terms of working in the community, working with uh, organizations, and helping them in terms of uh, meeting their, their funding needs and the like. So uh, that's their, their involvement, and I, again, I applaud them for that. Uh, but Suzanne, you and I were talking about, and you said you even asked your husband this, what does the, the fiscal cliff really mean? And what, what should we understand that it means to us? It is interesting because there is a lot of misconception. I think everybody focuses the fiscal cliff on primarily the Bush tax cuts. But as we were talking before the show here, that there are, there are several factors to the fiscal cliff, one of them being the super committee that was formed back in uh, last spring, spring, uh, spring of 2011, and they met, and in the fall of 2011, they could not come up to an agreement on how to reduce the deficit. And so because they couldn't come to an agreement, they left a year to say, you need to figure out how to work this out, and if you don't get this worked out by the end of 2012, there will be certain things that will happen in 2013. And many of those things are uh, cuts in spending, automatic cuts in spending. So we have the automatic cuts in spend spending as well as the Bush tax cuts commonly referred to that will expire and those were tax cuts that were a 10-year program that were entered in 2000, they expired in 2010 and then they renewed them for a two-year period so they expired in the end of 2012. So we're dealing with the spending, mandatory spending cuts, as well as, man, uh, in effect, mandatory uh, tax increases. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of all these things, the fiscal cliff, in addition to the fact that our debt ceiling won't be raised. So the fiscal cliff is the super committee, they said we can't increase the debt committee. So we have spending cuts, we have an increase in taxes, and we have a debt ceiling that can't be raised, which means that we default, in many cases, on our obligations because we can't afford to pay them. We can't, we can't borrow any more money to pay our debts. And so it's a combination of all those things. And, and what the, uh, what's the concern is, is that if this happens, this will throw us into a recession, a, a very significant recession, because of the mandatory cuts, the spending by the government, the, the borrowing issues that we're going to have, our credit ratings, as well as the income tax impact. And that income tax, we, we hear about the wealthy, we hear about the 2%. But the Bush tax cuts will be through all levels of, of income, middle income, lower income. There's a lot of, of spending uh, tax cuts in there that expire that most people don't focus on. They hear the tax rate piece, and there's a lot more to it. So what we're having to be concerned about is the tax cuts as well as the, excuse me, the tax revenues as well as the spending cuts, the debt ceiling. And so that's why it's so important that the uh, people of Washington, our legislators, work out something to be able to keep us from having these mandatory cuts put in place. And that's what all the talk is about. So much of it's focused on the tax cuts, but I think I look at it as a whole package. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we should be concerned about. Uh, everybody thinks, what about me? How is it going to impact me? Well, the impact is unknown, because if we go into a recession, the, you know, the impact on the economy, prices, or could we get into inflationary period with prices, could we get into uh, more layoffs where people are unemployed, we can't increase our debt, serve it, our debt ceiling, so what is the situation going to be where all of these things happen in 2013, and, and you can presume that there it would not be a, a good such financial situation, economic situation for the country. Mm. So, at first, I'm kind of along the line that you and I talked about, well, let's just go off the cliff. And yeah, we'll you know, people say, let's go ahead and go on off the cliff, and then they'll just enact, you know, some uh, tax uh, savings or special tax rate for the middle class, and then we'll take care of them. But it's not that simple, right? <laughs> it's not going to be that simple. But, I mean, I think everybody understands the complexity of it and how it is going to be important to, and, and they will reach something, and, and every, each 
party has to give something. Mm -hmm. um, there's no I mean, this is going to be there's no winners or losers in this situation. It's going to it's going to have to be a compromise, and so. I think everybody has come to that realization that there is going to have to be a compromise. And, and if there's a compromise by one party or another, it's not a weakness on any party. It's, mm -hmm. a necess it's necessary. It's necessary for us to be able to move on in a stable environment. The uncertainty about what's going to happen is paralyzing business, mm -hmm. is paralyzing individuals, consumers. And my, the clients I work with, they don't, the unknown, what is it going to be in 2013? It doesn't allow them to figure out how, if they're going to grow their business, if they're going to do an acquisition, if they need to liquidate, what they need to put away in investment, you know, to save to pay their taxes next year. And it makes the uncertainty in my mind is not good for the economy. We, mm -hmm. we see it with the market, the stock market. It's very emotional. What is, what's going to happen and what's going to be the impacts? So we have a lot of people sitting there kind of in the sidelines. I've really seen that since the elections were over. I think before the elections, People really didn't believe, you know, what was going to what was going to happen, depend on which, you know, what the, the outcome of the presidential election was going to be, and the House and the Senate. Since the election, I can tell you, the day after the election, our phones just started blowing up. I mean, mm -hmm. people were just calling, okay, now, okay, healthcare is not going away. What do I need to do? How do I need to prepare for that? What's our impact? Uh, the state, you know, the Bush tax cuts aren't going to get renewed as they stand now. So, so everybody's starting to realize it's a reality, mm -hmm. and we need to start planning. And even though we've been telling clients all along, we're just kind of waiting and seeing and, and what was going to happen. So we are seeing a lot more concern, mm -hmm. uh, our business owners, our individuals. And uh, it's not just the, the high income, it's the individuals. Um, some things like the child tax credit. Right now it's $1,000 per child. If the Bush tax cuts go away, it drops to 500 per child. Mm. So if you take a family of four with two children, that's a thousand dollar increase in their tax bill, mm -hmm. and they're not coming for that. They, they it hasn't been withheld out of their salaries. It's not it's not expected. So those things to anybody that's working could be very catastrophic to their financial budgets and their family. Uh, sales tax deductions. We hear all this information about tax rates. We hear about the tax rates and everything, but. The tax rate's only affected with what your taxable income is. Mm -hmm. So if your taxable income, if you don't have certain deductions, then you have a higher taxable income, and you can use the same tax rate. You could call it 15%, but 15% of $50,000 is different than 15% of $60,000. Mm -hmm. So I try to tell people not to just focus on the tax rate. Let's look at the deductions that may or may not be there and whether they're going away. And that's the piece that the uncertainty that we don't know what's going to happen. We know whether tax rates go up or not, what happens to the deductions, what's going to be the impact, are we going to see the economic impact where the business owners or the individuals that now have to pay more taxes, are they going to be not take that money now and spend it in other ways that they would? Mm -hmm. And that's the, the economic piece that we're looking at. And one of the things I ask you about, uh, it just occurred to me, which is what you hear about from seniors about the marriage penalty. And you were saying that's not in effect now because of the Bush tax uh, thing, but if that goes away, then those persons will be penalized again. Yes, the marriage penalty would go away in 2013. And what that means is if you took two single people, let's say they each made uh, $50,000 each, so, and you put them together, the tax that they would pay as two singles paying 50000 would be, right now, is equal to a married couple paying tax on 100 So there's no penalty. If, when the Bush tax cuts expire, that penalty comes back into place. So now, in 2013, as the law sits, the two individuals making 50000 each, single, pay, now filing a joint return, would pay more tax because there's a penalty to tax brackets. We actually see that already with the uh, Medicare, the new health care tax mm -hmm. related to Obamacare or health care or the Patient Portability Protection Act, whatever you want to call it. The 3.8% tax that they put in place for singles is 200000 For married couples, it's two fifty. It's not 400000 mm -hmm. It's two fifty. dollars So it 250000 So it goes from 200000 for a single, if your income is 200000 if you're married, it goes to 250000 mm -hmm. So we see a penalty right there right. that you're now having to pay more tax. You're going to have to pay this 3.8% additional tax 
if you're married making 250 versus maybe making 400. So we're already starting to see some areas in the, the code where the, in these new laws that are going to be an effective marriage penalty. Mm -hmm. And you and I were talking about the alternative tax. Yeah, the alternative minimum tax, which is uh, it's referred to as uh, uh, AMT, and the AMT tax primarily in through 2011 affects people that make more than let's say 200,000. And, and what it does is at these higher income levels, they said, okay, you're going to calculate your tax under the regular tax code. Then you have to calculate your tax another way, an alternative way. Mm -hmm. And there's certain deductions you don't get. Uh, for example, one of them being real estate taxes. You don't get to deduct real estate taxes or sales tax. And there's accelerated depreciation and all these different deductions. And you have to calculate your tax, assuming a flat tax, of 26 or 28%, depending on whether you're single or married. Then you compare the two. You compare your single, you compare your regular tax rate versus what you pay under this alternative method. And you pay the higher of the two. Hmm. Now, normally, if you're at 150, 200,000, it, it's not going to impact you. Well, the alternative minimum tax code was written back in 1969, and it was modified, I think, in sometime in the early 80s, and it was never indexed for inflation. So every year they've patched it. Every year they've thrown an, a patch on it and said, okay, well, we're going to index for inflation. And once you index it for inflation, it's over $150,000, so not a problem. Well, that patch has not been passed yet for 2012. So the alternative minimum tax reverts back to what the levels were in 1969 or somewhere around there, and we're at $45,000. Mm. So that impacts on quite a few more Americans at $45,000 than $150,000. And that's saying to our listeners, that's for somebody who's been earning $45,000 as opposed to somebody earning over $150,000, which means that it's going lower to a lower income bracket than it would have otherwise. And then you have to start being concerned with it. I mean, the IRS has already said that they've come out publicly and said that if the AMT, the alternative minimum tax, does not get patched to increase this threshold up to more like the $150,000, that it will be probably mid-March uh, before income tax returns can be filed for those people filing income where they're in excess of these, these limits mm -hmm. because they have not written the law or the forms or you can imagine the software and all of that has not been written assuming that the patch goes away. So there's some pretty big, uh, in our world, there's some pretty uh, major changes that are going to occur that we're just kind of waiting to see what happens. And with it being December 20th now, it's very uncertain. We, we don't know. We're already going to have delays. We know there's going to be delays in filing. There's going to be delays in forms, the, the brokerage houses, the individual, the software, you know, people that may be doing their own taxes or as professionals, the software we get. It's all going to be updated because they don't, they're all, they, don't, they don't know whether to write the software assuming that they're going to be extended or not. Now I'm sure mm -hmm. these guys are pretty smart. They've written two versions, but they, how far can they do that and be able to, and whatever ultimately comes out, we don't know. So we're we're in a very precarious situation right now with knowing what's going to happen. And, 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 and the way this stands, because my listeners may be wondering this as well, okay, we're, we're talking about things that are going to take place in 2013. So these things will be retroactive for the 2012 uh, taxes? Some things are effective for 2012. The alternative minimum tax, some of the things like the child care credit, certain things are already in effect for 2012. Mm. So they, if they don't get changed for 2012, then they will automatically occur. They will occur. So they have to be fixed for 2012. The major changes, the Bush tax cuts, are for 2013. Mm -hmm. But you're getting ready to have your new payroll for 2013 in two weeks. So you're withholding. What what amount do you withhold at? Most mm. most most Americans have their taxes held held out their paycheck. And if they're not held at, what rate do you start withholding these taxes out of? Are they at the higher tax rates, the lower rates? You know, are we going to have to play catch up on this? So that's where the impact. So that even for the stuff that doesn't occur for 2012, the stuff that occurs in 2013, since we don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. what what amount do you start having withheld out of your check so that you don't get surprised with a big tax bill at the end? And that's the the planning and the budgeting. So. People, you know, depending on whether you think it's going to change or not, I don't know that we're going to have an answer by January 1st what's going to happen. So it's going to be a little bit more savings maybe to be 
uh, careful that you're not going to end up with a big tax bill. Yeah. And for uh, a lot of uh, individuals who may not know it because it's already uh, an additional amount that's in their paycheck, there was the um, um, more money that was allowed to remain in your checks, I don't know the name of it, um, so that you brought home more money, and then that was that was one of the things that was um, you know approved to last longer as opposed to going uh, out. Uh, you you know what I'm talking about, where people are bringing home more in their paychecks, uh, and this was part of something that President Obama had passed, and then they they uh, reapproved it. Um, does that is that something that ends? Yes, it's the two percent payroll tax savings. Oh, okay. And right in, under the old law, you have 6.2% of your salary going into Social Security. Right, right. So they reduced that down to 4.2%. So it was a 2% additional money that you would take home. Most people mm -hmm. I talk to don't even realize no, that they, they had don't. a 2%. They just... <laughs> I'm actually, I'm, I'm one of those, I don't understand why they did it. Social Security just needs so much funding. Yes, right. I don't, yeah, that's I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I was kind of, it was one of those things that was passed uh, December of 2010, and it didn't make any sense to me at the time. I thought, you know, most people, it wasn't even on the table, and then it came out, and I thought, well, most people didn't see the 2%, and so why not fund the Social Security? But anyway, that's what they did. It expired at the end of 2011. In February-ish of 2000 well, they reenacted it, made it retroactive to January 1st, mm -hmm. and so that was a big nightmare because it was people withholding it and they had to calculate adjustments and all this, so <laughs> they got, and it does expire December 31st, 2012. Uh -huh. Now, whether or not they're going to they're gonna, uh, renew that 2% payroll cut, I, you know, we keep hearing back and forth on different things, or whether they even, they don't do it and they do a retroactive adjustment, but in addition to maybe some additional withholding being taken out of your check for tax income taxes, you may have an addition. You may go back to that 6.2 percent and have another 2 percent uh, taken out of your check that you've gotten used to for the last two years. So <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't oh know. wow! You know this is <laughs> uh, and this uh, and um, the the unemployment would also cease. The extended unemployment that people have been receiving, that would end too, right? Yeah. The end of December? That's also supposed to expire at the end of December. Our, our big issue is, is that you realize that when the federal government extended unemployment benefits, they mandated that, well, unemployment is paid by, is funded by the state. So it was one of those unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have in our unemployment fund the fund money to be able to pay out these extended benefits. I had to borrow from the feds. So we had to borrow from the feds. And there's a penalty for borrowing mm -hmm. from the feds. And that means higher unemployment taxes, not only for the state, but for all the employers now have to pay an additional tax to the federal government for the fact that we had to borrow money from them, which is it's interesting because they're the one that's mandated the extended benefits but yet there was no funding from the federal government to pay those benefits. They had to come out of the state coffers, which we didn't have the money, so we had to borrow benefits, and, and that's being paid back over a couple of years mm -hmm. through by your employer. The employees don't pay those uh, right. don't pay those premiums, but the employer does. So that's an additional cost to the employer that they now have to pay back penalties in effect to the federal government interest and and on these borrowed funds that we have. So. Whether or not they extend the benefits, it's definitely an impact on the state. It's an impact on the employers, and that means they have less money to be able to give raises or be able to reinvest in the business um, through these unemployment benefits. But for those people that need the unemployment benefits, mm -hmm. it's kind of a double-edged sword, sword for them, too, because they, they, you know, those, those benefits would not be there if the federal government didn't extend it. But somebody has to pay for those benefits. Right, and they've been extended now for a few years in actuality, as opposed to months, we're talking years. Yeah, it's been years now. Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not a pretty situation. And, it, and it's, not, it's not a free ride, is what you're saying, that somebody's got to pay for it, somebody's got to pay now, pay the feds back, and, and it, it falls on the shoulders of the employers. Even though the state has tried to help them by delaying it somewhat, spreading it out, reducing it somewhat, it's, it's really a, still a steep, um, steep, um, tax pretty much, because it is like a tax um, on, on the part of the employers. Um, the health care, so that we don't miss out in sharing anything in terms of, of what uh, people have to look forward to in regards to that. Uh, we know that there are some things that have already gone into place. Um, 
uh, I, I really thought, and is it is it not true that those that were uninsurable, so to speak, uh, are now covered, or does that happen later? Most of that happens in 2014. Uh, they, they did get rid of some of the pre-existing condition requirements so that people could get health care. They extended uh, for dependent coverage to the age mm -hmm. of 26. So there were th certain things that did come into play. The big part of it for the individual is in 2014. Because 2014 is when these insurance exchanges get set up. Mm -hmm. For employers with more than 50 employees, full-time equivalent employees, they, in 2014, they are now required to provide what's considered adequate coverage, insurance coverage, to their em full-time employees. And if they don't, they get penalized. And that money goes to the government, their penalties. And I, the, I don't actually understand what, what, the, government, what the federal <laughs> government's going to do with that money. So we have the employer impact. The employer impact is, is that they now need to provide this affordable coverage, and the calculation of affordable coverage is, is, like, is a book in itself to figure out what, 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 what is a full-time equivalent, what is affordable coverage, what all those things are. It's, it's very, it's not straightforward by any means. So our, we have to be concerned about, business owners need to be concerned to say, am I going to come under this requirement to, if I have full-time, 50 or more full-time equivalents to provide health insurance. And how do you define full-time because they changed that somewhat over time, but how yeah, many hours? For the Health Care Act, it is 30, uh, 30 hours. Mm. And you actually accumulate all your hours up and then you divide it out by the number uh, uh, of what a full-time person would be and you figure out your equivalent. So that's how you figure out equivalents. For providing the actual insurance, the insurance is based on the number of full-time employees you have. So that's why you hear in the news things such as like Darden Restaurants where they've cut out all these full-time employees and now making them part-time, probably working 29 and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Because they're obviously over the 50 employees, mm. the full-time equivalents, but they only have to provide the health insurance to the full-time employees. But the penalties are only based on full-time employees. So the consequence is a little unfortunate because you have people that would have full-time jobs that are now being cut back to 29 and a half hours, mm -hmm. um, and exp unfortunately, it's the low, maybe it's the lower wage earners, because if you think about health insurance as a percentage of their salary, whether a person makes $20,000 a year or $80,000 or $100,000 or $50,000 or $100,000, their health insurance cost to the company is about the same. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I'll just pick a number, let's you know, say it's $500 a month or something like that. So you're talking $6,000 a year for health insurance coverage, but for the employer, and if you take that for somebody that's making twenty ten dollars an hour, twenty thousand dollars a year, that's a big percentage of overhead for health insurance. So what we're seeing is the kind of the, the consequences, the unintended consequences of all these full time jobs being cut back to part time uh, by a lot of these employers. Which so now you have these employees that are working part time, so they don't have health insurance coverage. So what happens to them? They now have to figure out, based on their income, they now have to go to either go get an individual policy, one of these state exchange policies, if they're covered by Medicare or Medicaid, or if they're covered by military, they need to provide get some type of insurance coverage. Depending on their income level, their family household income, they may have be able to get credits back against the premium, so mm -hmm. in effect, help to be able to pay those premiums, and that depends the Credits are based on your income compared to poverty level. Mm -hmm. Poverty levels, let's say they're around $11,000, it's four times the poverty level. So what that means, anybody making over $44,000 has to make sure that they're not, they, get, they pay these premiums. Now I haven't seen all the calculations mm -hmm. and how this is going to calculate out. And in the same token, it can't be like more than 9.5% of their income. And it, there's lots of calculations, so I don't know how the individuals are going to figure out whether mm -hmm. or not they've what kind of credits they get and hopefully by 2014 the exchanges will have figured something out there to do that so if your employer doesn't provide your insurance or you choose not to pay for your share of the insurance that the employer provides because the employer can require the employee pay under income level to cover some portion of the insurance mm -hmm. so they can they don't have to pay 100 percent of it they they can pay Roughly 60%, so the employee might have to pick up 40%. Does this cover private and government employees? Yes, all employers. So with the state saying, and I know that's in the course right now, <laughs> about state employees paying $50 toward their insurance, uh, they could have actually said, oh, well, they did try to say that, too, that that was part of the Obamacare. <laughs> uh, but 
Um, I thought if employers did something where they either purposely didn't cover or they tried to force the employees to get their own, that there was some kind of a penalty involved with that as well. Yeah, it's called affordable, reasonable, affordable coverage, and there's calculations that you have to go through. The problem with the calculations is they're based on the employee's household income. Mm -hmm. And most employers, they don't have access to the employee's household income. So I'm not really, I'm a little confused and how, confused in how the employer is supposed to capture all this information mm -hmm. because that's not something they typically get. It and changes. it's getting into your private business when they, if they start asking and all this kind of stuff too. Right. So. Yeah, so it is, that's the part I don't, it is very difficult to understand how they're going to implement that. The other part of it is, is that I've been told by lots of different people in the insurance industry is because of the required uh, fact that you have to take pre-existing illnesses on and, and, and all these different things that the healthy individuals will go to the exchanges and get insurance because they'll be cheaper and the group plans will become more expensive. And I've heard numbers such as like doubling in premiums that these group insurance plans are going to double in premiums. So even if you're an employer that maybe you have less than 50 employees, full-time equivalents, so this doesn't apply to you, more than likely your health insurance premium costs are going to go up. Mm -hmm. Now hopefully, on the other side, we'll get better health care, more people will be covered, and, and the overall cost of health care that maybe you're paying someplace else will go down. I mean, that's the, the, you have to go back and look at what the purpose of this was, and that mm -hmm. is to get everybody covered by health insurance so we could have a ha healthier country right. and take care of those people that maybe weren't getting out of the care to cut the overall costs. And I've heard you can debate that lots, you know, every way you want to. So, but you know, I'm just, I'm here trying to figure out how to actually implement the law, whether or not the, we see the results we expect is mm -hmm. remains to be seen. And, and in truth, uh, in a new law, uh, we were talking about the devils in the details because the regs have to be written and everything as well. And you were saying for each page of law, it requires, what you say, what did you say, about uh, 100 uh, pages of uh, regulation. regulations or whatever. Yes. So we're talking a lot of regulations, but um, in a new law, as I started to say, though, is I mean, uh, it, it really does start out like a nightmare. It will be a nightmare, and probably that will be the case for years, and, and slowly some changes will come into place so that uh, what the ideal uh, kind of starts to blend into reality <laughs> uh, as we actually start to see these things um, like hit, hit the, hit the uh, floor and really start running. And uh, hopefully this ideal thing that we want to see happen, which is that all of us, you know, are, have access to insurance and we all become a healthier country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, such that all these things that cost us now in terms of health care uh, will be in some ways dealt with so that uh, probably 10, 20 years or so down the road, uh, we will have a healthier America. And, and one of the biggest problems right now, of course, is the obesity problem. And I know they have tied into the law to prevention and, and some of the other things that take place. I know even with my health insurance, they actually are paying for us to go to the gym. The wellness programs, yes. corporate, well, corporate wellness programs has become very uh, important. And, and uh, I actually went to a presentation from Florida Hospital where they talked about corporate wellness and how the hospitals are having to rethink. I mean, they make their money on people being sick, and mm -hmm. now they got to think about trying to keep people from coming to the hospital. And and so, I think if we can get the, the corporate wellness at the at the business level to really get the employees to buy in on that mm -hmm. and, and work towards it, it would make a lot of sense. Uh, I have to. We were talking about the legislation. I when I was preparing for one of my presentations, I the uh, the Office of Management and Budget, which is a federal office, they. Every year on IRS forms, they say how many hours it should take you to complete the forms. And they came out with a budget of 79 million hours a year to comply with the Health Care Act. Uh -huh. and, wow. and so if you take uh, somebody you know, working on it 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, it's about 2,300 full-time people doing that. If you figured they were working a 40-hour week, it's like 9,000 people every year just to figure out the health care act. Oh. Well, there's, there's employment, people, so if you want to know what area to go into, now you know. <laughs> yeah, studying the health care act. <laughs> now, what are some other key things that, that we haven't covered? Because I just wanted to throw those things out, because I know those are some of the things that, that people, you know, think about, that they've asked about uh, over time. Uh, there was another, what was the one that I had confused with the alternative tax, which is the yeah, one for the current. Income credit. Right. 
Uh, you see changes on that? Uh, it's still in place for 2012 and, and 13. It's been there for quite a while. What we're seeing a little bit more of is, um, for example, the education credits. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing we're telling people, if you've got kids, uh, children in school, that those education credits go away in 2013, and you might want to prepay that tuition. Mm. But you've only got 10 days left now to do it to prepay it for 2013 and get it into 2012 because the credit may go away, it's scheduled to go away for 2013. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at deductions that maybe will be going away and if you can pay them earlier to get them in, uh, that's always an option. This year's a little bit different uh, with clients that we're telling them uh, maybe like capital gains. We know the capital gains rate, we know that the, the new 3.8% tax is coming in for I have anybody in excess of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. So if mm -hmm. somebody has a large capital gain in one year, if they could schedule it for two thousand twelve as opposed to two thousand thirteen, I know all the title companies are going crazy because they're all trying to get closings done. I've talked to lots of clients that that we've been talking about this. Even stocks that might have some gains, where you know, clients are selling those stocks and then buying them right back to be able to recognize the gain mm -hmm. in 2012. I guess that would be good for the federal government because they're accelerating some taxes, they're getting the taxes in 2012, mm -hmm. because it's a difference of almost 9% if wow. the gain gets picked up in 2012 versus 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we're telling, I'm looking at too with a lot of clients, and this is a really appropriate for maybe a, a middle or lower income client that is a, a person that if they have an IRA, that uh, and say they have a bad year, they've been unemployed for the year, and they don't have a lot of taxable incomes, they don't think they need to do any taxable plan income tax planning, then I'm looking and say, well, if you happen to have an IRA over there, maybe this is a year to convert your regular IRA, which is money that you put in pre-tax, you've got a tax deduction for it, and then when you retire, you pay tax on all the income, mm -hmm. to a Roth IRA, which a Roth IRA you put the money in now, but you don't get a tax deduction for it, and then the earnings grow tax-free when you take the money out after you retire in at least five years. So there's an opportunity there for somebody that maybe has, had, has owns a business and it's not, they have a loss for the year, they've been unemployed, and if they have these IRA accounts, they might be able to convert them to mm -hmm. Roth without paying any tax on them. Mm -hmm. And getting it from a taxable income event to a non-taxable event and leave, let that money be set aside to grow tax-free. Mm -hmm. So those are some things I, I did a presentation for the Board of Realtors, and we know realtors always have good years and bad years, and some of, some of them I saw that I could tell the look, and they're like, okay, I, maybe this will be good for me this year. I'm going to find some silver lining and not making, and having a bad year. Right. So, uh, so I'm always trying to think about things for people that aren't necessarily, you know, it's not always about the high wealth, it's maybe just about minimizing your overall tax rate mm -hmm. so that you can have more for your future and, and retirement. And thinking of, uh, in terms of real estate and the like, short sales, because a, a lot of people have been going into short sales and, and that can come back and kind of bite them in the butt because of that money that, I guess, that's being lost, but they can also still be held accountable for it or whatever else. How is, how is that, is that changing at all uh, for people? Yeah, but unfortunately, the short sales, and I actually we did an article for the News Journal back in September, it's a little bit too late now for most people, but there's an exemption right now on a personal residence that if you short sell or, or, or for, you know, give back your property in lieu of a foreclosure and you're relieved of debt, that the, the amount of debt that you're relieved of is taxable income mm -hmm. under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, is that right now, up until the end of 2012, if it's a personal residence, you have up to a $2 million exclusion. So in other words, if you owe, if you owe the bank $200,000 for your house and you short sell it for uh, $50,000 and you're relieved of $150,000 worth of debt, which if you short sell, you should make sure you get a waiver of the deficiency so they can't come after you for mm -hmm. the balance you have $150,000 of the taxable income. Under the current law that expires on December 31st, 2012, it's not taxable to you because you have two million, up to a $2 million exemption. Mm. That expires on December 31st, 2012. Mm. What's going to happen in 13? What if you short sell your house in 2013? Are you going to have to pay tax on that $150,000 now? It's, it all depends on your overall financial situation. It's not an automatic anymore mm -hmm. unless they renew that law to be able to deal with the principal residences. The other debt forgiveness is if the short sales, like if somebody has an investment property, it is, can be very negative. You have to really understand what your tax impact is. I do a lot of work with 
uh, individuals that are short selling other things. When I tell them about the principal residence, they're relieved. They're like, okay, I'm, I'm good here. <laughs> and I don't know what I'm going to tell them on January 1st when they call me. I'm going to say, let's hope they fix the law. But, um, and there has been some talk about them extending that. Mm -hmm. So what we try to look at is what we're more concerned with is where people have uh, sec uh, rental properties or potential investment properties or some other real estate or just general debt, credit card debt. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you know, they get those 1099s from the credit card companies. That's taxable income. They've got to be insolvent or some, you know, how are they going to go about not, and sometimes they don't do anything with it and then they get a lovely letter from the IRS that says, you didn't pick this up as taxable income and you should have, here's your tax bill. Mm -hmm. And then you got to deal with it. So if anybody's having those situations, they need to make sure they're getting good advice on how to treat that debt forgiveness income, the cancel, we call it cancellation of debt. It can be from a house, it can be from a credit card, it can be from any amounts of money that you owe to somebody and you don't pay it back. Mm -hmm. mm, wow. Uh, now, anything that we've got, <laughs> because we've got another uh, 15 minutes, let me just say uh, that you're listening to Truth with Gwen Asma Edwards. My guest, of course, is Suzanne Forbes, uh, CPA, office manager with James Moore and Company, also chair of the Halifax Area Chamber of Commerce, but uh, Suzanne and, and her company, they deal with uh, individuals and with businesses, commercial, uh, governmental, they deal with it all, and uh, they stay abreast of all of the changes that are going on, and she's here sharing and giving you guys just a nut, nutshell of, of, of what you can expect uh, in terms of 2012 and in terms of us in 2013. Um, but, uh, and, and this is WLE 1380 AM on your radio down in Ormond Beach, Florida, uh, Goliath Radio. Uh, Suzanne, in, in terms of um, uh, health care then, uh, are there other things that uh, are on the horizon in terms of, we know 2014 is when a lot of the, the other things will kick in, but in terms of 2013, um, what can we expect? And um, the employers, it, it really sh <laughs> ah, the employers, the employers, the employers. Um, I often, I, and I will say this, and I'm sure there are other people out there too, I, I really thought that um, in terms, I know in uncertainty really uh, forestalls uh, employers taking risk, uh, even investors taking risk. But I really thought that in terms of Obamacare that some of that stuff was kind of, yeah, uh -huh, you just don't want to support the present president. Uh, and then, uh, and then you know, I, I know the fiscal cliff has an impact, and, and we've talked a little bit about that, uh, but I don't think, and, and we know that a lot of people don't even realize what the total impact will be for that, and they don't understand why, you know, I heard a reporter say, well, why is the president throwing in this stuff in terms of, uh, uh, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, or whatever else, when that's not even on the table? Well. It is on the table in truth because, as you said, it's about revenue, but uh, generating revenue, but it's also about uh, reducing uh, debt and reducing expenditures by government. So um, all of this stuff is, is stuff that will and does impact us. It, it will impact us even more as we and if we go over the cliff, but... Um, because this stuff is already automatically going to happen. That was already, as you stated, part of the agreement. Uh, so uh, as we, I guess I'm trying to find a silver lining in there somewhere. <laughs> Are there any silver linings in 2013 or uh, that people will be able to, um, to utilize? And uh, you talked about some things that will still carry over, will change as of 2012, but as they get ready to prepare for their income taxes. Silver linings in 2013, boy, <laughs> that's a loaded question, because we uh, we just don't know, and we don't. I think, um, you know, I tell, I joke about the fact I now have a magic eight ball on my desk as opposed to a crystal ball because I just the crystal ball broke. Um, I would be very surprised if we do end up going into 2013, or or I, you know, even if we go into 2013, that some compromise is not reached. And it will be retroactive. I mean, I, I do, in my heart of hearts, believe that um, our legislators will do what's right and they'll figure, figure out a compromise. And, uh, you know, sometimes when both sides are unhappy, you're successful. Everybody's mm -hmm. equally, uh, neither party, neither side gets what, everything they want. Mm -hmm. And that's probably good because that means it's a good, it's a win-win. It, or you can say it's a lose-lose, but I think it could be a win-win. Right. So, you know, I think that for 2013, if we can get, if they can get this resolved early on and get stability, if we can get back into some known 
consequences. We, I mean, that was one thing about 2000, uh, once we got out past 2010 with the, with the changes, at least, like 11, one thing I believe is the one reason why we saw some economic growth was because everybody could focus on business. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they get back to business. And the president said that too. Yeah, know. we got to get back to business. Everybody is spending so much time focusing on what, you know, what is going on. What if? What if? Yeah. How, you know, uh -huh. that you can't, there's an opportunity cost. You can't spend time thinking about how to grow your business, how to take care of your family, how to improve your own personal financial situation. Maybe, you know, you know going, maybe changing a job. I mean, people, you know, the, the you know, we, we find that right now that we're looking for people. We want to hire people, but good people don't, they have jobs already and they're smart and they know not to change jobs in this type of environment mm -hmm. because they'll be the low man on a totem pole in a new, in a new location and so they, with so a new, true, the new yeah. employer, and so they're not going to take that risk. So a lot of the people that are out there, that, you know, they're, they're out there and, and you know, they've taken a risk and maybe it wasn't a good calculated risk or they've been laid off and and so it's been very difficult uh, from an employer standpoint really finding when we're, what we deal with is a high, very high technical skill. Mm -hmm. So we have to, so I think that if they can get it done early in the year where maybe they get some stability or he knows how to plan to understand what the impact's going to be. And I think it will take some time. I mean, once everybody adjusts and gets used to the thought process, I'm already saying you know, even after the election when everybody realized that the Health Care Act was not going to go away, and they started dealing with it. Okay, well, what do I need to do now? Even though a lot of these cut, these impacts don't take into place until 2014, the uh, there's a look back period. So you look back to 2013 for the number of employees, which is why you're seeing things happening in 2012, mm -hmm. so that some of these employers can position themselves. So when they're in a look back period, so don't just think you can't deal with it until 2014 if you're right at that threshold. And I've had businesses say, I just will not expand. I will not go there because I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't pass that cost down through my, to my employers, my, my clients, my customers, and I can't afford to pay that, um, you know, to be able to reinvest in my business. So I've had some of that. You know, other ones are saying, well, and, you know, some people are saying, I'll just pay the penalty. It's cheaper for me to pay the penalty. The penalty incrementally increases up to over between two to $3,000 per employee by the time we get to 2018. So mm -hmm. I don't know that that's the answer either. It's, it's going to be somewhere, and I think once the regulations get, they're talking probably uh, end of February, beginning of March, will be a lot of the regulations will be out. That's going to mm -hmm. help calm people's nerves. That's, I think that's really the biggest issue I'm seeing right now is everybody just doesn't know, they don't know what to, to expect. Right, right. And I don't, I'm not crying, you know, saying, oh, everybody's got to be corner, but it, it's going to, it will work out. I think individuals need to be, they need to be reading and be listening to shows like this to be understand what their impact is. Mm -hmm. They need to ask questions, they need to be informed, all those things so that if 2013 comes around and we don't have an agreement, they need to decide. Do I need to go ahead and have some extra withholding paid in so I don't get surprised at the end of the year? Mm -hmm. I know for our clients, we're going to try to one their projections, assuming that they have the same income in 12 as they do 13, and make them aware. If you have the same event based on the current tax law, this is what your taxable income is in 2013, mm -hmm. this is what you would pay in taxes. So they can be aware of what the, the difference will be. So planning, uh, no surprises, as much as we can. I think that's, our, that's the strategy for 2013. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll come to some uh, earlier than, sooner than later, an understanding of what, where they're going to head with this in, in, um, in Congress. But it's, it's going to be an interesting year, no yeah. doubt. And as, as optimistic as, as you want to be, I'm sure you're also planning the worst scenario, worst case scenario too, such that if, if nothing happens, uh, then everybody's looking at paying higher taxes. You know, we have to prepare people for it. I think there's there's a middle ground. It's somewhere in between. I just if they don't if they can't reach a compromise and we do go off a cliff, well, there's, all bets are off. Then I mean, it's it's going to be very it's going to be very through all all individuals, mm -hmm. all different levels. I mean, there'll be very few people that will be uh, unimp unimpacted that won't be impacted by this. And I think that's I'm concerned because I don't think people realize that all they hear is the higher income and they just hear about the two percent and so the 98 percent aren't worried. And I'm saying the other. You know, maybe it's not the 98 percent, but it should be about the other 70 percent or somewhere mm -hmm. along that line. That need to be concerned about what their impact is going to be to them. And again, so they can plan appropriately. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it is, if it's a fact of life, they're going to pay more taxes. Then they need a plan. They mm -hmm. need to understand that. They need to budget for it appropriately, so they're not surprised at the end of the year, or it's not catastrophic financially, or they can make some informed decisions. So I keep telling them now is even more important to be 
educated and informed on what the impact is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things uh, that, that we've heard about uh, has to do with um, the fact that you really, uh, if you would end up owing more money, then you can usually work with government to try, IRS to try to make a payment plan or something like that, which is a possibility. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, in terms of looking at even the, the health care issue, um, are the health care plans, and maybe you, you don't have enough information to know, but are there health care plans that people are a part of now that would actually meet the requirement that you be a part of a health care plan? Or the new, will the new regulations pretty much dictate whether or not a plan qualifies? Because I know at the state level they're talking about uh, the uh, ex health care the exchanges and whether or not the one that the state is coming up with now that they're going to go forward with, whether it will meet the criteria and they're saying, no, it won't, there's something else they have to add and all this kind of stuff. So health care plans that people are in now, should they, should they be concerned or worried that that won't meet the need when 2014 comes and, and so they might end up being penalized or whatever? Absolutely. They definitely need to be speaking with their insurance carrier that understands the insurance piece of the health care law to make sure that their plan is going to comply. Not only is their plan going to comply, but whether or not what the employee has to pay versus the employer, mm -hmm. if they're sharing, the if they're passing some of the costs through their employees. They need to understand whether or not that is going to be acceptable under the 2014 law. Mm -hmm. if most insurance um, agents and underwriters and they seem they understand that and they are talking I know in our business they're talking to us about what our our plan coverage is and, and whether or not they're going to you know it's going to meet the requirements yeah. so I think that that is um, an absolutely necessi necessity now I had it was posed an interesting question to me and they said well what about if your health care plan insurance expi uh, renews uh, July 1st so it's a uh, it's a July say it's a June year end and so July 1st 2013 you have to enter a new insurance policy, and it's going to go into 2014. And what's the impact there? And I'm like, I don't have any idea. I'm like, does it, does it grandfather in because it's a start date? Or And some people have actually told me that some insurance carriers won't issue a policy that goes beyond 2013, mm -hmm. that they're, they're changing the cutoff. So I've heard lots of different, and I don't have those answers. I'm sure mm -hmm. we'll look at somebody in the insurance yeah, right. to see. So there's a lot of, it's, it's a kind of a, a shared responsibility. I mean, there's the tax piece of it, which we are, you know, we're obviously deep in, deep into understanding. But there's also the application of it from the insurance side, mm -hmm. and what does that mean? And is my coverage adequate? Uh, what am I covering? Who am I covering? All those pieces, and it, so that you don't get subject to the penalties, which is, and I don't even know how we're as a tax professional going to know. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be getting information from insurance companies, and I mean, I can do math calculations, but I don't, I can't un analyze the coverage right, to figure out right. whether this coverage is Absolutely. appropriate. So I'm not even sure how we're going to get that done yet. But you know, and even seniors in terms of Medicare uh, or and Medicaid in some form of fashion, I mean, all of that is also tied into it. And there may be changes that will also pull that into it, and as such they will fall into the same kind of situation. You know, is there sufficient coverage for whatever and all these? I mean, it, it, it really is, as you said, it's just so much that's up in the air. And I, and I have to say, though, even with all of that, we had to make this, in my opinion, we had to make this happen to make sure more people are insured because uh, uninsured people, sick people, infect other people. <laughs> you know, sick people affect uh, healthy people and 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 time off for sickness or whatever really affects the productivity of America as a whole as well. So um, we we had to do something. The other thing is that you know people truly have short memories. And I remember when healthcare before Obamacare, so to speak, uh, health the healthcare costs were going up. I mean, every time you looked around, there was an increase and increase and increase. We're not talking a little bit of increase. We're talking major increases. And um, that was not sustainable either. So uh, where we find ourselves now is in a situation where there is still some uncertainty, but 
uh, at least we grab hold to the bull, so to speak, and uh, it might be dragging us to, I don't know, whatever, but, uh, but we grab hold and we're, we're, we're going to try to, you know, get that, that, uh, that uh, bullish uh, health care, you know, racing off the cliff um, cost, soaring cost under some kind of control. Uh, but there will be, and, and what's uh, for, for you as, a, as an accountant is, is that we've got all these things happening at one time that we're dealing with all at the same time. We've got the health care uh, situation, we've got you know, the fiscal cliff and, and, what, and the economy, what's happening in the economy. And then at the same time, not just what's happening in America, but what's happening overseas that's also impacting us. So all of these things uh, happening at, a, at the same time, and I think they've even referred to it as some kind of a fiscal uh, tsunami or something. <laughs> oh, gosh. And I already said, okay, what's, what's the silver lining? And there, there isn't much of any. Uh, but the bottom line is that, as you said, people need to start thinking about these things. You know, I know it's the holidays, and, you know, let's enjoy the holidays. But let's also understand that uh, at some point in time, it will be time to pay the piper. And, you know, you don't want to, ex to expend uh, funds that you don't have for, <laughs> and then end up looking at a situation where you're not only paying for all those great gifts and things that you've overextended yourself to give to somebody, but you've also got these other things that are coming in to play. Uh, that you may have to be paying for it too in terms of your taxes. So um, uh, enjoy, but but be not necessarily leery, but you know, at least be in a state of um, thinking about seriously that you might have some needs. I'm saying that to the listeners. You might have some some financial needs. Uh, that come into play because of all of this stuff that's happening. Um, for individuals, uh, we've talked about what, what you guys are saying to the commercial and the businesses and the like. Uh, businesses, what are you pretty much saying to them? Because I know you said to me about businesses, you're telling them that, you know, in terms of health care and all of that, they need to plan on having maybe 10%. Yeah, we're, we're looking between the health care and for the tax piece only, not for the premium piece, mm -hmm. but for the health care tax and the income tax rate changes that they might need, they need to budget a 10% increase in their total tax liability. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few provisions in, in businesses like the uh, bonus depreciation, being able to write off fixed assets sooner, uh, what's called a section 179 write off, that this year you can actually write off um, you know, certain uh, up to $125,000 worth of equipment that was purchased during the year. So we're looking at those things for clients at year end that maybe they want to do they want to do these asset acquisitions. Unfortunately, that we don't know if they're going to be in place for 2013. Mm -hmm. And yet, if the tax rates are going up for 2013, we're in a strange situation where we may want to pay the tax now at a lower tax rate. So getting these accelerated depreciation deductions or other deductions may be better if we knew we, they were going to be in place for 2013. But mm -hmm. we don't know. So those are things that we're continuing to look at for a business owner to figure out if they have an opportunity for a business to be able to get any income into 2012 and pay a lower tax. But we're telling our, our uh, businesses and, and business owner clients that are paying it at the personal level to plan on if they're in the, a, a higher tax bracket. Of course, that bracket number keeps changing. When it started, with a, there's a million, there's 250, there's 400, mm -hmm. it's all over 400,000, 250,000, a million, I don't know, pick a number. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but we're telling them that you need to maybe consider that you're going to set aside, need to set aside another 10% mm -hmm. of what you paid in taxes for 2012 for 2013. What does that mean for those businesses? It means they can't maybe buy something, they can't hire people, they, they, they don't how are they going to pass that tax through to their customers? Are all of us going to be paying more, which is the inflation piece that I can, I'm concerned about? Mm -hmm. But they definitely need to be aware because they, they're, the financing piece in a business is much more complicated than at the individual level. Mm -hmm. But our, So our businesses need to try to make sure they're still maximizing deductions. And the deduction retirement plans extremely important to be able to set up retirement plans, get money put away in a retirement plan. You can defer that income. You can take a tax deduction for it now. And retirement plans aren't something that you can bunch 
well, I'll take, instead of taking the deduction in 2012, I'll wait and take it to 2013. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Retirement plans are a year, they stand, each year stands alone. So not taking the deduction in 2013 doesn't mean I get a double in 2000, and, not taking in 12 doesn't mean I get a double in 2013. Mm -hmm. So we're telling even more so, I think retirement plans are becoming even more important as these tax rates are increasing, getting that money into retirement plans as well. I mean, we've heard all sorts of different like tax exempt income, municipal bonds, things like that, with people investing in them. They become much more, when you're talking a marginal rate of 33% to 43%, mm -hmm. they become more attractive. So we're seeing some of those things that, that are driven by tax liabilities are going to change and become more valuable. There's lots of different examples, annuities we're seeing, lots of different investments that people are considering now because the tax rate is getting to that tipping point for them that maybe it makes sense to go into some of these type of investments versus others. How that impacts everybody, uh, you know, like I said, my crystal ball's not working, so, <laughs> so, uh, they, uh, so we are seeing it from the businesses. They need to be aware, they need to understand what their tax liability is. I was talking with a client today and I said, and I was helping them and I said, you know, make sure, let's, let's talk about these things and, so that they can be aware mm -hmm. of, the, of what's going to happen in 2013 as it stands right now. And everybody understands we, just, we don't know for sure, but there's some things that you know, I think most people understand of higher brackets. There's going, you know, we can pretty much count that there is going to be some tax rate increases. Mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if the Bush tax cuts don't expire, I mean, if they don't get renewed, then they expire, there's going to be tax rate increases. They reach a compromise, at some level of income, you're going to pay more taxes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and we 3.8% health care tax is there, so we know there is going to be some tax rate increases. We just don't know on who and how much. Mm. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, so in actuality, the, the, the bottom line is that irrespective of, as you just said, irrespective of what happens, that somebody's most, if not all, will be paying higher taxes. Because that's how the government gets its money, you know? <laughs> uh, and the government has to get more money so that we can reduce the deficit in addition to reduce their spending. So both of those things have to occur, just like in a private household. Yeah, just like in a private household. Um, uh, are there any other key issues that we've not covered uh, that because uh, Suzanne, and you still do you do that for organizations, groups that would like for you guys to mm -hmm. come and make a presentation. She is available. Uh, she and her staff to come and provide a presentation for uh, your organization, and she's done a few of those already. How can they contact you, Suzanne, or your company? Um, we can be contacted on, on my the office number for James Moore and Company is three eight six two five seven four one zero zero. And you know, just ask for me, and I'll be glad. My my email address is Suzanne. It's S U Z A N N E at J M C O dot com, and it's J as in James, uh, M as in Moore, C as in Company, and O as in Oscar dot com. And we'll be glad to come out. I mean, that's part of our responsibility for the community: to come out and educate people, talk to people, make people aware. We've done lots of these uh, presentations. We actually do webinars. We have recorded webinars that mm. you can go to and you can listen to the webinar at any point in time. So it's at your schedule to, to try to help people understand. The only area that we have not talked about just briefly is mm -hmm. estate taxes. A uh, lot, lot going on right now for those that are fortunate to have an estate problem of a $5 million estate. Uh, those uh, right now you can, under the current 2012 law, if you have a $5 million estate, you can give them to your heirs and not pay the estate tax. If you have in excess of a $5 million estate, the tax rate is 35%. Mm -hmm. Under the current expiring tax laws for 2013, that goes to $1 million. Uh, and if you've read the book The Millionaire Next Door, that people don't, you know, there's there are more people than you think that have a million dollar there tax really estate. There really are, and a lot in Volusia County, believe it or not. That's right. <laughs> so, we, uh, the, you know, I always refer to the millionaire next door, and so for 2013, that uh, currently, as law stands, drops down to a million dollars, and anything in excess of a million dollars gets taxed at 55%. Wow. So that's a significant yes, it is. change in the tax law, and there is, we are, I've, I was, before I walked in here today on the phone, we're, we're trying to make sure that if we need to get some gifting done, any estate planning, make sure that people have their wills and their trust current to be able to make, you know, take advantage of any tax savings they can save. They've worked really hard all their life mm -hmm. to, to build this wealth and pass on to future generations. 
that we want to make sure that they, their wishes are. So it's very important to make sure that your, your will and your estate plan is up to date. And, and, and that also includes, if it's not done properly, your life insurance. So some people may say, oh, I don't really have that much, but they might have a million dollar life insurance policy or something out there. They need to make sure that they're titled properly and that they are, you know, when they, they're looking at the whole picture there. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to think about their, their, you know, their you know when they, they pass and, and leave us on. But it's, so we are doing a lot of looking at the estate planning right now to make sure that we can um, make sure that people are doing the right things there. Mm -hmm. So that's another piece, um, the whole other, we could spend a whole other hour talking about that, <laughs> but it is um, it's a significant impact. There's talk about compromise there, what, where it's going to end up, we, we obviously don't know. Mm -hmm. Whether it's going to be somewhere between a million and five would be my guess, but what the tax rate is going to be, uh, we don't know, and um, people need to be prepared for that. If, if you're in a situation where you're, you're fortunate enough to have that type of a taxable estate, you need to try to protect it. Okay, and because you are chair of the Halifax Area Chamber of Commerce, uh, I know that you guys have a special uh, guest, a speaker that's going to be here in February, so we can tell our listeners oh, about yes. that if we can. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Oh. Yes, it's the annual, the chamber annual dinner, and as chair, because I'm outgoing chair, I finished my last board meeting today, <laughs> and uh, I turned over the reins January 1st, but our annual meeting is February 11th, and we are having one of the judges. Uh, Damon Johns from Shark Tank uh, come to be our speaker and he is a very dynamic gentleman. He actually formed, uh, he grew up in the Bronx and he created his own company, clothing company, and he, uh, he's over six million dollars a year or, or something, I, no, it's more than that, I don't remember what his sales are, but it's a, a large amount of um, his sales, maybe in the billions now, and he talks about marketing and how he's about branding. He's quite entertaining and it's going to be the focus of the annual dinner is going to be focused on innovation in our own backyard. We have mm -hmm. some really great success stories right here in Volusia County. We're mm -hmm. going to highlight those those and, and I'm not going to give it all away yet because we haven't got it all completely tied up, but we're going to we're going to take it through the education system all the way out to business to talk about what successes we have here. Uh, Dame John is going to make it a, a Shark Tank. If you've ever seen that TV show, it's on ABC at 8 o'clock on Friday nights. Adventures come in, they bring their ideas in, and there's a panel of five judges, and they personally invest money mm. into these companies, and they try to pitch, the, the inventors try to pitch their, their invention, and then mm -hmm. they, they talk about them, and they decide whether they're going to make the investment. I think last year they made like over $5 million in investments. So he is quite the entertainer, and he's going to come for and be our keynote, but not only be our keynote, but it's going to be a very interactive evening. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be different than it not just coming and sitting and listening to, mm -hmm. to, to some. I mean, he's very successful. It's very interesting listening to his success stories. I've watched a lot of videos about his success, and I think it's going to be one of them. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it's one of those most memorable uh, annual <laughs> dinners, but it's going to be very exciting to bring somebody like him that has had has the entrepreneurial spirit, has the success, has been successful in his business. I really wanted to focus on business, and that was mm -hmm. when, I, when I came in, as I said, it was back to business, and we were to focus on that, and I've had a lot of people comment that this would be the first CEO type speaker we've had at the you know, for a long time I don't know at, at the annual dinner so it's not about politics and sports for those some of you mm -hmm. have been there before so I'm very uh, as you can tell I'm very excited about it and it, it's going to be a fun evening so I hope all you listeners and elders can come out and join us for February 11th it's going to be at the Hilton and uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun that night I promise you that <laughs> now we will share with you it is a it is um, a high ticket uh, cost it's what a hundred dollars for chamber members, yes. Yeah, and 125. I think it's 150 for non-members. Non -members. But you can find a member, I'm sure. Uh, yes, you can find a member. You can bring <laughs> you as a guest or whatever. Yeah. But uh, well worth it. Well worth it. We assure you, the food will be great, but even more so, the information that you will receive from this uh, speaker, who is he was uh, really young, pretty well known, and you know, if anybody can help you to understand how it happens, you know, we can go from rags to riches, which is basically his story. Uh, then, then he will definitely do that. So we do encourage you to get with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, if you are interested in getting a ticket, the ticket, uh, I'm a Chamber member, so I've gotten the information that the tickets are going fast, so, <laughs> uh, because I'm sure there is a certain number at which they can no longer admit someone because of the space is still limited. So uh, please, 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 if you're interested in going to that event, uh, get with our uh, Halifax Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, 
251 uh, Chamber of Commerce and tell them you're interested in purchasing a ticket and they'll let you know what, what it is that you can do. Or you can go to the Chamber website and, uh, and then click on uh, the uh, annual dinner uh, for February 11th for that and then uh, hook up with someone in that regards. Um, I do want to thank you, as always, I really try to get her on here at least once a year, especially to get to the tail end of the year to talk about uh, taxes and what it is that, that, uh, that all of you have to look forward to. And this is even an even more important time, so uh, my thanks to uh, Suzanne uh, for coming on again. She's with James Moore Company. Uh, and, um, and she's giving you her information. I'm going to ask her to do it one more time before we go off the air. Suzanne Forbes, again, uh, office manager, James Moore and Company, and the contact inf that information is phone number and website? Phone number is 386-257-4100. And my email is Suzanne, it's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E, -N -N -E, at jmco.com. Now, you do have a website, right? Yes, it's www.jmco.com. Okay, uh, because she has mentioned that there are webinars uh, to inform people, and that would be a good place to go as well. Oh, gosh. Okay, this is the last show before Christmas, so let me just reinforce the fact that I do wish all of you out there a, a very, very merry, merry Christmas. We will have a show before New Year's, so I won't necessarily get into that, but do have a merry Christmas, and do enjoy your family and your friends, and, and enjoy and be thankful and grateful for what you have. Uh, because as bad as things may be for you, there always is always someone else that is, is in even worse condition. Uh, so we do want you to take care, enjoy, uh, but be thinking about some of these things we've been talking about tonight because they're very real and, uh, and it's very, very important to you and to your family. So until next time, be informed, be empowered, say and talk for what uh, is right and truthful. And again, this is Truth with Vanessa Edwards, and like you, like Suzanne and James Moore and company, and myself, we are still standing. You be blessed and have a great week and have an outstanding Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas. God bless. Your host, Edwards. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we got everybody confused now. <laughs>